Hello my dear student. So today next topic in chapter plant water relation is translocation of food through flowing. Now here carbohydrates are mainly formed in green cells of leaves and are supplied to non-green cells. Food synthesized in leaves is made available to all parts of the plant and it is also transported to the storage organs of the plant. Now here the storage organs and leaves are considered as supply end or source while the growing regions are considered as consumption points. Right? So here the storage organ and leaves are the supply end and the growing region they are the consumption ends or the sink end. Right? Now the important word is supply end and the sink end. Now the transport of organic substances from supply end to sink end in higher plants is known as translocation of organic solutes. Now food is stored as starch, protein or in the form of fats and oil but is transported as soluble sugar through spatial conducting tissue and that is phloem. Right? Now the course of translocation means the direction of the transport of organic solutes in phloem varies during the developing stages of the plant. So what are those? See in the case of young seedlings, food moves upward this direction. Okay. So in young seedling, food moves upward from cotyledons to young plumule until leaves are produced and they begin to synthesize the food. So, till the leaves are produced, by that time, up to that time, the in young seedlings, food moves upward from cotyledons. Right? Now, next case, food migrates from leaves to roots in downward direction for storage. So, here in this case, upward direction and here in this case, that is downward direction for storage. Third case, food migrates in upward or lateral direction during growth and development of flowers and fruits. Now here in this case, the food migrates from the supply ends up to the sink end. That's why, just see, that food migrates in upward and lateral direction for the growth and development of flower and fruits. So, from supply to sink end. The last one is the radial translocation of organic solutes occurs within the stem cell of pith to cortex. Pith center portion, cortex outside. So, so this radial translocation will also takes place. So, in the young seedling, upward direction movement. In the, uh, that is from the leaves to the storage organ up to the roots, downward direction. Here food migrates in upward and lateral up to the flowers and fruits and in this case radial translocation. Right? So this is the course of translocation. Now path of translocation and its mechanism. Now here what happened? Organic substances are translocated in upward or downward direction through phloem. Now here, according to Munch hypothesis, a turgor pressure gradient, this one, turgor pressure gradient, exists between the supply end and the sink end or consumption end. So because due to the, according to the Munch, that because of turgor pressure gradient, there is a movement between the supply end and the sink end. Now what is turgor pressure? I already explained my previous video. 
that it is the force within the cell that pushes the plasma membrane against the cell wall and it is caused by the osmotic flow of water so this turgor pressure gradient is responsible for this movement from supply to sink end translocation of organic solutes takes place through phloem from the region of higher concentration see from the region of higher concentration of solute that is supply end fine now where the production takes place actually to the region of lower concentration that is sink end so translocation of organic solutes takes place through phloem from supply end to sink end from higher concentration of solute to lower concentration of the solute so this is all about the translocation of food through phloem now transpiration okay now the root system absorbs a large quantity of water from the soil out of the total water only 2% is utilized for various activities of the plants and remaining about 98% of water is lost to the atmosphere through aerial parts of the plant now what is transpiration this loss of water from aerial parts of the plant in the form of vapors is known as transpiration okay now there are different types of transpiration depend upon from where that is happening first one is cuticular transpiration here now cutin it is a wax like substance which is deposited on the wall of epidermal cells cutin forms a thin or thick layer on the epidermis of leaves and herbaceous stems and this layer is called cuticle now this cuticle reduces the loss of water but is not strictly impervious to water now what happened here about 8 to 10% of water loss occurs through cuticle by simple diffusion method so this is all about cuticular transpiration right now come to the next and one more thing before that the rate of cuticular transpiration is inversely proportional to the thickness of the cuticle so depend upon the thickness of cuticle so cuticular transpiration is inversely proportional to this now the next one is a lenticular transpiration now here lenticels are fine pores present on the older parts of the plant here lenticels are present in the bark of old stem and pericarps of the woody fruits so old stem and pericarp of woody fruits they are made up of loosely arranged cells and about 0.1 to 1% of water loss occur through lenticels here i have drawn the diagram also this of lenticels now here you can see this is the upper epidermis and where it is present lenticels on the bark of old stems isn't it so here this old stem that is you can see on the bark you know, where the rupture portions are there and these loose cells are called so this portion is called lenticels right so only 0.1 to 1% of water loss takes place through lenticels and that is called lenticular transpiration now come to the third type that is stomatal transpiration now it occurs through stomata present in the leaves okay on the surface this one and young stems stomata are the minute pores present in epidermis here i have drawn one section also ts of leaf you can see here upper epidermis 
lower epidermis. Fine. This upper epidermis, you can see the cuticle is present even here. Now what happened? When you take the section, internal that shows this palisade parenchyma, then spongy parenchyma, here the vascular bundle is there and here the stomata is present. Fine. Now this is the section of the dicot leaf. That's why you can see the stomata are present in the lower epidermis. Now we will study about the type of stomata also. So before that, about 80 to 90 percent or 90 to 93 percent of water loss takes place through the stomatal transpiration. Now stomatal transpiration occurs only during daytime when the stomata are open. This is one important point related to the stomatal transpiration. Now depending upon the distribution of the stomata in the leaves, there are three types. One is a hypostomatic. Now what is this hypo? Hypo means when lower epidermis. Stomata are present on the lower epidermis. It is called hypostomatic type. Means the number of stomata. Example we can say here the mulberry. In this case. So all the stomata are present on lower epidermis. So because of this distribution they have given another name hypostomatic. Next is the epistomatic. When it is present on the upper epidermis. See, on upper epidermis. Example, aquatic plants. Fine. Now, amphistomatic. When they are present on both surfaces. Upper epidermis as well as lower epidermis. That is in the case of grasses. This is the example. Now, here I have drawn for the dicot because just I want to show the parts. When you take the section of the leaf. What you will see, so upper epidermis, palisade, spongy parenchyma, then lower epidermis. So if that is hypostomatic, lower epidermis. Epistomatic, then on the upper epidermis. And if amphistomatic, means on both the epidermises, the stomata are present. So in this way, under the transpiration, we have studied about different types of transpiration. So now, structure of stomata. So typical stoma is elliptical aperture surrounded by guard cells. Now the guard cells are, there are two types or we can say depend upon the shape. So one is a kidney shape and dumbbell shape. You can see here kidney shaped guard cells present in the case of dicot. And dumbbell shaped guard cells are present in the case of monocots plants. So the two types of the guard cells depend upon the shape. Now the inner wall of the guard cells which surrounds the aperture is thick due to the presence of secondary wall layer. Here you can see this is the inner line means surrounding the aperture, stomatal pore. So this one is a thick layer because of secondary wall layer. Right? Now the guard cells have outer thin and permeable wall means this one outer side. So that is thin and permeable and inner side is thick because of secondary wall layer. Now opening and closing of stomata occurs due to the osmotic change in the guard cells. These are two guard cells. So if there is a change in the osmotic potential then the opening and closing will take place. So that we will study further the mechanism. Okay. Now when the guard cells are turgid. Due to endosmosis. Endosmosis when the water will enters into the guard cell. So they become turgid. And then the stomata get open. And when guard cells are flaccid. They lose water. Because of exosmosis. The stomata get closed. So this is about the structure of stomata. Now come to the mechanism of closing and opening of stomata. Now one scientist Levitt. He proposed that proton transport concept related to opening and closing of stomata. Now, according to him, he explained the mechanism of closing and opening and based upon what? Proton transport concept. Now, according to this, opening and closing takes place as a result of an active transport of potassium ions. Into the guard cells and out of 
them. So when these potassium ions enter or they move out, depending upon that, the opening and closing takes place. And the adjacent cells, means these cells, which are present around the guard cells. These epidermal cells, or in some case, that is also called as subsidiary cells. These epidermal cells act as a storage cells for the ions. For the guard cell. So what, what I said? The adjacent epidermal cells will act as ion storage cell for the guard cell. Because from there only the ions exchange will take place. Okay. Now this is mechanism proposed by Levitt. And which theory he proposed? Proton transport concept or proton transport theory. Now look here. During the day time. What happened during the daytime? The starch prepared by the photosynthesis converted into malic acid in the cytoplasm of the guard cell. Means this cytoplasm portion. You can see chloroplast is there, nucleus is there. This one to guard cell, stomatal pore. So this portion is the cytoplasm. So during daytime, starch converted into malic acid. Okay, in the cytoplasm of guard cell. Now this malic acid will dissociate into hydrogen ion and malate ions. When after the dissociation, now hydrogen ion is present and malate ion is present. Now this hydrogen ions will move out of the guard cell. And potassium ions will enter into the guard cell from this subsidiary cells or from this epidermal cells. Fine. Now this intake of potassium ions will be balanced by intake of chloride ions. Fine. Now potassium ion and chloride ion they are entered in the they entered in the guard cells. Now this raises because they now they enter. This raises the osmotic potential of guard cell, and when osmotic potential raises then endoosmosis will take place. Endoosmosis means the water will enter into the guard cell and because of which the guard cells become turgid and when the guard cells become turgid then the stomata open. So this is the result during the daytime. Fine. Now at night so during the night time what happened? Photosynthesis activity will decrease. Fine. So, carbon dioxide concentration will increase in the guard cell and pH become acidic in the guard cell. So, concentration of carbon dioxide will increase, that become acidic, the pH of that guard cell. Now, in the presence of carbon dioxide and abscisic acid, this one, this will inhibit or this will prevent the intake of potassium and chloride ion. Why? Because carbon dioxide concentration is more and abscisic acid is present. That's why now the potassium and chloride will, ion will not enter into the guard cell. Because now why they will not enter? Because of this acidic nature, there is a change in the diffusion and permeability of the guard cell. So because the carbon dioxide concentration and abscisic acid, the permeability and the diffusion changes of the guard cell. And because of which, that will inhibit the uptake of potassium and chloride ion. Right? Now, what happened? Potassium and chloride ion will move out. Why? Because they are not entering because of this acid and carbon dioxide. So potassium and chloride ion will move out from the guard cell. When they move out, osmotic concentration of guard cell will decrease. And when osmotic concentration or osmotic potential will decrease, then what happens? Exoosmosis will take place. So exoosmosis means water will move out from the guard cell. So exoosmosis will take place, guard cells become flaccid. And when they become flaccid, stomata close. Right? So this is the way opening and closing of stomata takes place. 
and this theory proton transport theory is explained by levitt so main which ions play a play important role here potassium ion chloride ion so when they enter osmotic potential guard cell raises endosmosis when potassium and chloride ion they moves out osmotic potential decreases exosmosis will take place they become flaccid guard cell stomata will be closed so this is all about the structure and the mechanism of opening and closing of stomata now the last part of this chapter that is significance of transpiration okay now advantages here the advantages of this one is that it removes the excess water okay now continuous water stream is maintained due to transpiration pull this concept transpiration pull already i have explained in my previous video then it also help in ascent of sap transpiration also helps in reducing the temperature of leaf and avoids the plant being heated overheated it gives cooling effect we can say in simple words then transpiration it also maintains the turgidity of the plant cell so these are the advantages of the transpiration now this advantages here the excessive transpiration causes water defect and plant can suffer from the injury due to desiccation this is the one disadvantage of transpiration now though it is an energy sapping process so transpiration helps in absorption translocation isn't it you can see transpiration pull is there ascent of sap so there transpiration helps in absorption translocation process hence according to curtis transpiration is necessary evil fine so sometime in the board exam they asked explain the statement that transpiration is necessary evil so what you will write fine the transpiration is a energy sapping process or the loss of water is if in excess amount then the plant will suffer from injury but still transpiration helps in absorption translocation and because of this only transpiration is a necessary evil so in this way this chapter is finished thank you